unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grantham Asha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Bashan. This past September, India's parliament passed a long-anticipated piece of legislation known as the Women's Reservation Bill. The bill, which sailed through both houses of parliament within days of being introduced, reserves one-third of seats in the national parliament and the various state assemblies for women, formalizing a quota that has long existed at the local levels in India, but never at higher levels of politics. To discuss the bill, what it says, why it was passed, and what it might mean for Indian politics more generally, I'm joined today by the political scientist Carol Sperry. Carol is an associate professor at the University of Nottingham, where she serves as the director of the university's Asia Research Institute. She's the author of two important books related to today's topic, Gender Development in the State in India and Performing Representation, Women Members in the Indian Parliament, which she's co-written with Shireen Rai. I'm pleased to welcome Carol to the show for the very first time. Carol, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. So I want to begin by shedding some light on some basic facts about women's representation in India. And maybe we could start with the very big picture. What does female representation look like in the parliament and the various state assemblies today? And how has this picture changed over time? Yeah, thank you. And um, to start with, we can say that... Um, the representation in the Lok Sabha and up in the lower house, the House of the People, um, it's never really exceeded much beyond 15%. And this is, um, as a number of legislators around the world have uh, increasingly uh, improved their representation of women, this has actually placed India sort of globally, comparatively, and um, lower down in the scale of ranking of women's participation in lower house of legislatures. Um, unfortunately, the um, picture with regards to the state assemblies um, is in many cases even worse, uh, much lower, um, although the, the average does vary across states. And it's a really interesting phenomenon how um, what factors affect actually um, women's representation at the, the state assembly level. Um, for example, we see in some states in South India, which usually has very good representation uh, indicators of development for women, um, in some states we have very low participation of women in states, uh, state assemblies. So uh, in terms of changing over time, it's moved at a very, very slow pace. And also, unfortunately, what we see after some state elections is uh, women's representation actually goes down as well. So it really doesn't um, necessarily improve at this kind of incremental uh, pace. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. And when it does increase, it increases at a very, very slow pace. And I just want to point out, um, because it's a bit at odds with it, with another statistic we, we hear a lot more about, which is that uh, in 2019, for the first time, we saw women's voter turnout um, reach par, basically, with uh, with male voter turnout, which is a big shift in India. You know, women have traditionally participated um, much less than men in state and national elections. There had been for decades at 8 to 10 percentage point discrepancy. Um, and now they're almost on an equal footing. In fact, in, in many recent state assembly elections, we see women turning out in, in, in greater numbers uh, than men. But yet, when it comes to the candidate side, um, we're, we're not seeing that. Is that something, Carol, that um, that that surprises you? It, I wouldn't say it surprises me in the sense that we we know that parties have a gatekeeping role in terms of the selection of candidates. Um, it's unfortunate, and it, I mean it's a fantastic improvement in voter turnout among uh, women voters. And I think this is evidence that when you do engage uh, with women voters, and when you do. Um, I know the Election Commission of India did a lot of work on voter education. They had a number of campaigns um, since 2000, especially, to try to encourage women to vote more um, in elections. So I think that's one of the reasons why we see more women uh, voting and more um, women voters turning out during elections. And I think it's a really interesting um, phenomenon that has caused parties to pay more attention because of the increasing power of women voters. Um, so I think we we do definitely see that varied across states and some states in recent years have definitely closed the gap in terms of that gender voting gap. 
So some states that were lagging behind in terms of women's turnout, um, such as Gujarat, for example, they uh, women used to turn out in much in fewer numbers than men voters there, and I think that has improved over time. But then some states um, often had sort of fairly good women voter turnout. So I think it depends on to what extent women are politically mobilised and also encouraged to participate in elections as well. Uh, let me kind of step back uh, and refer back to something that I mentioned at the outset, which is that uh, there are uh, quotas for women at the local level. So you have in India the 73rd and the 74th Amendments of the Constitution enacted in the early 1990s. Uh, those provisions mandated the reservation of one third of seats for women in uh, what are called panchayati raj institutions. In fact, some states have have have, have made the quota even larger than than one third. This was hailed as a, a pretty progressive move at the time. Carol, I guess my question for you is, why wasn't that same logic of reservation put into place at the local level? Why wasn't that logic extended to higher levels of government? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think it's important to note from the start that um, reservation for women um, in government, but also in the civil service as well, that, that's been something that's been debated for a very long time since pre-independence as well. And I think this was also the subject of a debate during the landmark towards equality report um, in 1974 as well. So this, this debate has been going on for quite some time. And I think in the 1980s, uh, I know that women, many women politicians also um, tried to praise uh, Rajiv Gandhi's attempt to improve women's political participation because it was the dominant party then. But we saw in the early 90s um, this Panchayati Raj Act. Um, this was included, these reservations were included as part of a broader piece of legislation on local government um, rather than a kind of singular bill on its own to introduce gender quotas. Um, but we saw very soon after that a number of women politicians and activists, particularly led by the late Gita Mukherjee, um, who was a communist uh, politician from West Bengal, um, they tried to introduce a women's reservation bill at higher levels of government, um, the first bill kind of dating back to, to 1996. But this failed. And as you know, Milan, the 1990s was very much a time of fragile coalition governments as well. Um, it was a time when caste reservation, uh, Mandal politics was heavily debated. And I think one element of opposition to the bill for many years has been the lack of inclusion of a quota for marginalised caste groups. And that's not including the already, already constitutionally mandated reservations for scheduled castes and tribes, which um, would have been included in the bill uh, already. So I would say that the failure to pass the bill um, or to failure to introduce and pass a bill at higher levels of government was both a mixture of opposition to the bill itself, but also the challenges of coalition politics in those uh, in the 90s in particular, um, and to some extent after that as well. Since that time, of course, we've seen a number of attempts. Um, I guess the most significant one was the Congress-led coalition um, attempt when they introduced it in 2008 and then passed it there in 2010. But as you may recall, it was passed amid very controversial scenes in the Raja Sabha, um, with opponents protesting the bill having to be physically removed from the chamber. Um, but I think a remarkable scene from back then were some pictures of, of women politicians from across the political spectrum coming together um, with kind of jubilant faces at that kind of uh, inter inter or intermediate um, victory. Um, and I think... It's it's interesting to see that that coming together. Um, I think it's it's a remarkable scene. You know, as you mentioned, you know there have been bills amending the constitution to reserve seats for women in parliament and state legislative assemblies uh, introduced uh, it, it many years. Right, ninety six, ninety eight, ninety nine, two thousand and eight. As you mentioned, that was the the last kind of valiant effort to get this across during the tail end of the UPA government's first term. Ultimately, um, as you rightly pointed out, it came up short. I, I guess this begs the obvious question, which is, why do you think the Modi government decided to try again at this juncture? And why did it succeed, whereas in the past it had failed? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I think there are several possible reasons. Um, now, we know during the second term, the BJP have passed several major pieces of legislation, several of which have altered the constitution and the landscape of India 
um, figuratively and, and literally, literally, you could say. Um, I would I would say that you know one argument is that you know they are finally getting around to this um, as a piece of legislation that they did have set out in their manifesto. However, we also know that um, from research on Modi's style of leadership, he's someone who uses symbolism to convey meaning and effectiveness as a leader. Um, we know that um, Modi or the, the BJP are in a single majority, single party majority, so they don't really have much reason to be able to not pass the bill because they um, don't have to get the numbers uh, as previous coalition governments had to. Um, you could also argue that India is currently the host of the G20, so um, it is very good optics as well. It may attract more attention than usual. Um, there was a heavy symbolism in the passage of the bill. It was the first act in the new parliament building. It was uh, part of a special session. And um, you could also argue that it would help India's performance in sustainable development goals as well, because it was a few years back, Nitya Yog had a report a few years ago where um, SDG 5, which covers gender equality, including gender equality in decision making, um, among other indicators, this SDG 5 was actually the worst performing indicator of all SDGs. So improving India's scores in this indicator may potentially go some way to improving that overall performance. Um, but that said, I think it comes back to your question earlier, Milan, who, which was about um, women voters. Um, so we have um, the passage of a bill that will be potentially very significant to women voters. And we know that women have as you said, been increasingly turning out um, and increasing their power in Indian elections. So it's potentially a very good signal to women voters that the BJP have made um, a commitment to um, women's political participation. Um, but of course, um, as we know, it's not necessarily going to be implemented in time uh, for the election. Well, so so that's a that's a great segue to what I wanted to ask you about next, which is, you know, I think maybe we should stop and just go over some basic elements in the bill. Uh, as we said before, the bill reserves one third of seats in the Lok Sabha and the various state assemblies for women. This means that only women will be eligible to contest elections in these reserved constituencies. Obviously, the entire electorate is eligible to vote uh, and pick the woman candidate uh, that they choose in those constituencies. Uh, coming to the, the, the delay, as it were, reservation will only commence after delimitation takes place, which is kind of in Indian parlance, uh, parlance uh, the, the, the word or the term for redistricting. That can only happen after a fresh census is, is conducted. Um, as many of our listeners will know, there was to be a census in 2021. That has not happened. We don't have any indication of when it will happen. Um Whenever the census happens and we get a delimitation, uh, and then by extension we will get reservation, reservations will be on the books for 15 years unless Parliament uh, expressly uh, authorizes their, their extension. I guess the natural question to ask you, Carol, is what the link is between women's reservation and the redistricting or delimitation process, right? Because I think many critics have said this is just a delay tactic. Actually, there's, there, there's no reason why these two things have to be uh, connected. Is that how you see it as well? Yeah, I think so, I think so in the sense that it doesn't seem, um, you know, arguably they could implement it and then they could change, um, they could still do the redistricting. So it doesn't really make sense as to why they need to delay it um, rather than just change sort of later on. Um, I mean, if you go right back to kind of early independence, we, we had um, the very different kind of uh, seat arrangement with dual member constituencies um, that then changed in, I think it was 57. Um, so... It's not that India hasn't, I mean, maybe that was very complex and maybe they don't want to have to repeat that sort of exercise, but it doesn't seem to be a good reason as to why not kind of have the implementation happen in time for um, the next election. And then if there are changes to be made, just as in 2009, right, we had a delimitation exercise in 2009, the constituencies changed. Uh, in terms of the, the reservation for uh, scheduled castes and tribes. 
So it doesn't really um, doesn't really make um, much sense necessarily. Um, there may there may be things that you know uh, I'm not aware of. People on the outside are not aware of the reasons for why they want to do that. But I think certainly they're going to. Um, if it comes back to symbolism and the immediate sort of tangible benefit that they're going to get from that potentially uh, in the election versus, um, you know, what it will look like in implementation um, later on down the line once the constituencies have been uh, redrawn. Um, I think that's something that is going to be very hard to to tell at this stage. Um, but for me, I think that that immediate symbolic benefit and um, they're going to get the benefit of that potentially yeah i mean it, it seems like uh a, a a way to get um a lot of bang for the mm. symbolic passage you don't uh, necessarily have to pull the band-aid off right yeah. away right because you're kind of kicking the can down the road i mean it could be five years it could be 10 years we don't mm. really know um, and if this is truly a random draw where you're picking a third of constituencies, it doesn't really matter what districting looks mm, like, right? Mm. Because it's just it's just sort of a third. So I think there are a lot of people who have who have concluded from that that um, that it is a, a bit of a, a, a sort of delay tactic. Let me let me kind of pivot to asking you a bit about um, why this is important. Um, you better than than most scholars know that a wide array of countries have experimented with gender quotas, right? And there's a huge literature in political science, but also across the social sciences, including in India, looking at how gender quotas have worked at the local, at the panchayat level. And that has produced or provoked a debate about uh, how far reservations have gone to truly empower women. So I guess, you know, there's a big question for you in here, but I think it's probably one that we have to uh, countenance, which is, you know, how confident should we be that the policy of reservation for women can act as an effective instrument for their uh, eventual empowerment? Yeah, I mean, this is something that, um, I mean, I talk to my students a lot about this. And of course, scholars, when we get together at international conferences and we're, we're kind of learning about quotas, even just last week, we had a departmental um, seminar um, talking about different quota laws, both in the European context and in um, Sierra Leone as well. Um, and it's really fascinating. I, I think essentially we really have to be careful to assume that a gender quota um, for the election of women will solve all of the issues that women face uh, in politics. I think it is an important step um, because of some of the um, effects and the consequences um, that it, it creates and it has. But as we've seen in many other countries, there are other challenges that remain after a quota has been introduced, um, that the quota doesn't really, it's not really going to affect. Um, but also, and, and that includes some of the earliest quota adopters in the Nordic countries, for example. So they still have many challenges. Um, several states that, that have quotas still have many challenges. And some new challenges that arise as a result of gender quotas as well, because the dynamics um, are slightly altered, the incentives are slightly altered. Um, we know even from, from the panchayat level that um, women may be treated slightly different when they are elected on a quota as well. Um, but also, I think, you know, parties um, will adapt as well, will adjust, will adapt um, and this comes back to a point that I was going to mention um, around uh, delimitation as well. It's interesting to see that, um, you know, the BJP won't necessarily have a first mover advantage in this because parties will have plenty of time now to actually sort of do better in terms of their political recruitment of women candidates. We'd like to think that they will uh, get, to, get to doing that. Um, so there are a number of kind of prior stages around the pipeline, women coming into politics for parties to, to be able to have um, candidates to be able to nominate. Um, but there are also kind of subsequent political activities and sort of horizontal political activities that quotas, gender quotas won't necessarily um, solve. And I think that's, that's um, one important aspect. The other thing, I guess, to mention... Um, is that, well, essentially we need many tools and strategies depending on the issue, and we also need to be vigilant to new challenges arising, unintended consequences of quotas, for example. Um, 
the other thing to mention is that we've seen in some countries that um, in some countries with authoritarian governments that gender quotas are very much in operation there as well. Um, but it doesn't necessarily equate to meaningful participation in politics. Um, so we have to be careful about assuming that a quota necessarily um, entails meaningful participation in the political process as well. Um, there are the ways in which uh, the research has shown that women's participation can be included, uh, can be can lead to um, women's empowerment, um, particularly coming out of the US, but other places as well, where it's shown all kinds of effects with regards to access to resources, access to political networks, access to the bureaucracy, um, being able to um, act as a conduit um, for representing uh, women's issues, for getting um, access to state resources uh, for women communities in particular. Um, but I think it's also intrinsically important um, to be able to have access to decision making, uh, particularly um, over issues that are obviously going to affect um, women in their community as well. Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. You know, I, I, there's kind of an alternate uh, policy instrument that that could have been used. I want to ask you about that. Some critics have argued that, look, a better policy uh, measure would be to mandate that parties give one third of party tickets to women candidates. So this is actually something that two political parties in India did in advance of the 2019 general election, the Trinamool Congress of Mamata Banerjee and Naveen Patnaik's uh, Biju Janta Dal of Odisha. Um, in your opinion, is this a better way to go? Or how do we think about you know uh, the, the pros and cons of that approach, which is saying we are going to actually mandate that parties give a third of tickets rather than reserving a third of seats? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, it partly depends on the political system um, and also the penalties for non-compliance as well and essentially a party's sincere implementation of the quota. Um, so reservation, reserved seats, uh, guarantee a certain percentage of women. They really guarantee the outcome. Um, party, um, party quotas don't necessarily guarantee the outcome. They guarantee the selection, um, assuming that the parties do comply. Um, but they don't necessarily guarantee the outcome. So there is a decision um, there in terms of what what is the ultimate goal of the quota? Is it to make sure a certain percentage of women you know, are actually sitting in parliament after the election? Or is it to um, increase the opportunities for women to at least contest elections? Um, with party quotas, there's no guarantee of the final winning percentage because women may be fielded... Um, against other women, they may be fielded against men, some women will win, some men will win. Um, but there's also plenty of ways that a party can avoid meaningful compliance with mandated quotas. So there does need to be meaningful penalties for non-compliance if a party doesn't meet the quota. For example, if there's a financial penalty, the party may just choose to take the hit financially um, in order to field the candidates that it wants to field. Um, so the punishment has to be uh, punishment for non-compliance has to be stricter, such as um, the rejection of party nomination lists, for example. That's I know that's the case in a number of countries, um, and that affects all candidates and, of course, the party's chance of success in the election. Um, and then the party can comply with the percentage, but of course it can nominate women candidates in seats where it knows that they don't actually have much of a chance of winning, either because the party's not very um, uh, popular in that seat or it's because they know that there's a very um, strong incumbent or a strong uh, candidate from a rival party there. Um, so they can nominate women candidates in those seats just to comply with the quota, but it, it essentially is setting up those women candidates to fail. Now, I think in terms of um, political systems, you know, there's a, there's a bigger question here in terms of what quotas suit what political systems or what electoral systems. Um, and we know that in proportional 
systems, um, some sort of strategies to get around those things have been used in order to um, guarantee uh, a certain percentage of women being returned, even if it's a party quota. But because, uh, so one strategy is called zippering, where essentially if you've got a, a party list, you have um, among the candidates, you have man, woman, man, woman, man, woman. So no matter how many um, seats that party wins on that proportional list, um, essentially there'll be 50% uh, women that are returned and 50% men. Now, of course, uh, India being first past the post system, uh, parliamentary system, um, that's not an option open. So it's really about the context and the options open uh, in the Indian context. I want to ask you kind of about another design choice that was made by the government this time around. And it's a key difference with the previous bill that was under consideration back in 2008. So uh, our listeners may recall the 2008 bill would have rotated reserved seats for women after every election. So every five years in theory. This new act uh, doesn't do that. It doesn't include any provision for seat rotation. So if a constituency is reserved for women today, it will remain reserved for the next 15 years uh, or until there's um, some kind of redistricting done. Um, uh, Carol, I, I want to get your thoughts on this. How should we think about the idea of a rotation? Is 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 not rotating seats every five years, every election um, a, a good decision? Uh, yeah, I think this is a really interesting change because I think Previously, with rotation, um, there was there was a concern that um, it would change the incentives for performance among MPs, right? Because if they know that essentially they've only got five years to make a difference, but even after five years, they're not necessarily going to be eligible for, for re-election to that constituency. So in some ways, it's an improvement to um, essentially ensure that there is still an incentive to uh, for that legislator to perform and to be re-elected. Um, and that would have affected both men and women um, because men's, uh, in terms of general candidates rather than reserve seats, they would have um, had to uh, perform. And if they knew that their seat was coming up for um, rotation in the next round, that would have disincentivized them to some extent. Um, however, we know that um, in the Indian context, there is actually quite a high turnover of legislators as well. The, the re-selection and re-nomination of legislators actually tends to be quite low. A, a party can very much, and they do, parties do often, um, just radically um, sort of change the face of their, their nomination lists um, during elections. Not always, but... They do, do do it, I think, um, more than in many other countries where it's almost a given that if you're an incumbent, you won an election, then you're pretty much going to get the nomination um, unless you choose to step down. So certainly in the UK, I think that's a more common um, expectation that if you're the incumbent, you get the choice as to whether you're going to stand or not. Again, um, the, so breaking the link with the constituency because of, res, uh, because of rotation, I think it's a good... Um, change that that's not going to be rotated but I've still yet to think through what the potential consequences of of not um, rotating are including and it comes back to your point about which constituencies will be um, selected um, for um, reservation and it'll be interesting to see um, how that affects how constituencies are perceived as well in terms of um, the prioritisation of those issues and, and whether there's any unintended consequences of, of not being rotated. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's one that I'm, I'm thinking more about as well, thinking about that, that rotation consequence. Yeah, I mean, just to kind of put a, a bit of a finer point on it for our listeners, I mean, imagine if you were in a constituency that was reserved for women and you were the incumbent, but you know that next cycle um, your constituency will no longer be reserved um, and chances are, given the odds, that a male representative will replace you because that's been the dominant uh, history. Um, that may change your incentives in terms of how you govern, how you behave. 
um, in the five years that you have. Similarly, if you were a representative in another constituency, say a male, and you know that uh, your constituency is soon to be reserved for a woman, it might induce a kind of short-termism, right? So if you could think about someone who's who's thinking whether or not am I going to engage in rent seeking, <laughs> um, if you know for sure you're gonna not you're gonna be out of a job, it may change your incentives. Versus if you know that you might be up for, for re-election, right? So I think this is one of the things that's, that is that that uh, is a potential uh, uh, ne- negative externality of, of rotation, as, as, as you mentioned. Um, I, I want to ask you a little bit if we can kind of shift from, from, from the kind of, you know, reservation debate to kind of what happens inside of parliament, because this is really where you've done quite a lot of work, right, into developing insights into how women work in parliament, and the challenges they face and and some opportunities that they also face, right? And and one of the key themes when I go back and, and read some of your previous writings is that, you know, both formal and informal institutional norms in parliament affect how women members experience parliament and perform representation, quote unquote, which is a term that you use. And I'm wondering if you could just kind of, you know, step back and give us a flavor of, you know, what are some of those formal and informal norms that shape how women actually function once they're elected as legislators? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I think some of the things that we focused on were really about how women perform representation and also how Parliament is, um, as an institution, what kind of a space is Parliament? To what extent are women um, seen as the, I guess, um, natural inhabitants of that building, of that space, you know, in, in terms of are they seen as kind of something that's outside of the norm? There's a fantastic book that we um, refer to quite a lot um, by somebody called Nermal Pua, um, called Space Invaders, um, which essentially is, you know, it's a fantastic title, but it's, yeah, right, Space Invaders. And it's it's really about trying to understand, um, and it's focused on sort of the UK uh, Parliament and Civil Service, but it's trying to understand within any given sort of political institution, who are the kind of um, typical inhabitants of that and who goes past unnoticed, you know, who goes past unnoticed because they're seen to be or assumed to be um you know, this is their space. This is this is the natural inhabitant of this this institution, um, and then who is seen as an interloper in that space. And um, so, I think the, the subtitle of the book is um, "Raced and Gendered Bodies Out of Place." Right. So, there's a number of, um, uh, and it, it, it's a really interesting book because there's a number of kind of anecdotes and, and uh, references to uh women particularly black women in the uk black women mps that you know they might get mistaken for somebody um like a member of staff um the cleaning staff for example using the wrong lift for example and it's really um it just really goes to show how some uh, mps particularly um white middle to upper class um mps might pass really um sort of the, their assumptions about their occupancy of that space being very kind of natural so there's, there's kind of informal norms like that and just kind of actually sort of inhabiting space. Um, but then there's also some very um, specific examples around participation in debates and in committees. So when women's presence in numbers is so few, they end up being very, very spread um, thin. So there's definitely advantages to having more women um, in Parliament just because it means that the roles that they can perform are more diverse, potentially more um, their presence. They don't have to be um, kind of expected to do uh, everything and they can specialise in various things. Um, So it can help to normalise women's presence, potentially change kind of external perceptions. Um, There are a number of very active and vocal uh, women MPs as well. Um, But just having more women in Parliament, I think, can help that. One thing that we looked at a little bit was um, the extent to which women are given opportunities to participate in debates and at what point they're given opportunities and in what um, in what way they're given opportunities. So we, we referred to this um, following uh, a scholar of um, Latin American gender politics. We referred to this as speaking rights. So how do women MPs get speaking rights in debates? We, we can see that a number of um, parliamentary party leaders are men, 
Um, so by virtue of their position in Parliament, um, in the Parliamentary Party, they often do get um, much more time during debates. And of course, if they then speak for longer, that can then actually reduce the time that women um, MPs within that party also have uh, to contribute. We've also seen a couple of examples where um, women MPs uh, have been vocal in requesting the Speaker to um, assign more women MPs to committees where legislation is being debated that very much affects women's uh, lives, decisions over women's bodies, for example. Um, so we've seen a number of, of cases where women MPs, senior women MPs, have spoken up to try to get the Speaker to um, improve women's participation in committees. Um, but we still have um, Committee for the Empowerment of Women. It's still um, very women-dominated, um, almost, and, and there's still some committees that, very important committees that are almost entirely male, um, including many that debate major legislation or control the parliamentary agenda as well, uh, to the extent that that committee is still uh, important in the current um, configuration. So there's a number of informal norms just around um, the style of participation in debate as well. We've seen a number of um, unfortunate examples where we've seen kind of sexism in the chamber, um, whether that's very direct hostile sexism or other kind of more benevolent forms of sexism in the sense of, um, sort of treating women differently in ways that um, isn't necessarily helpful to their participation. But there's also a number of informal norms within um, kind of behind the scenes, shall we say, behind the scenes um, that, that we try to explore in the book as well that we would argue do make a difference on women's uh, ability to participate uh, in the parliament. I, I want to kind of end by asking you a, a, a bit of a, a, a broader question on kind of women and in, in governance, right? Because this particular BJP government has campaigned on, and I think is seen by many constituents to have delivered on, a promise to place women at the forefront of governance, right? So if you look at its campaign rhetoric, um, it touts many of its schemes, whether it's Swachh Bharat, Jandan Yojana, the Ujwala program, as evidence of its desire to empower women on the ground, right, in the kind of grassroots level. But yet, some critics of this approach point out that, look, equating women with welfare schemes is in and of itself problematic because it's only reinforcing gender stereotypes about, say, the women's place in the household and so on and so forth. And it actually serves to kind of reify existing inequalities. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how do you respond to this critique that that, that some have uh, have lodged? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting point because I think, um, in essence, there are very practical issues that things like resources that women need access to to be able to do the things that they do in their everyday life. But then there are also strategic concerns that will actually change their position towards a more equal position. So um, you know, this is a, a fairly common distinction in the development studies literature between practical and strategic gender interests, um, where certain schemes um, just make um, existing conditions easier to um, easier to kind of daily life easier basically um, and then more strategic policies that actually change women's status and uh, create um, a, a less um, or essentially create greater equality and move them away from um, very stereotypical uh, types of roles and, and try to reduce and eradicate those those inequalities. Um, so I think it, it's a really difficult one. I, I should also say that um, I think some some of the recent schemes um, of the national government have really sort of reflected some of the earlier schemes of certain uh, regional governments as well. So I think actually this is this some of these schemes aren't necessarily new um, in terms of the kinds of benefits that they're seeking to deliver to women. And I think certainly some of the southern states, um, I mean, I, I guess one of my first entries into South, uh, into Indian politics was through South India and, and Tamil Nadu politics. Um, and I think we saw a number of schemes there that, that often sought to 
both reduce the drudgery, everyday drudgery of, of women, um, but trying to move them towards um, a kind of uh, a different um, experience and, and trying to reduce those inequalities. My guest on the show this week is the political scientist Carol Sperry. She's an associate professor at the University of Nottingham, where she serves as the director of that university's Asia Research Institute. She's the author of several books, including Performing Representation, Women Members in the Indian Parliament. Carol, um, I know that you have been following this for a very long time. It must be kind of exciting uh, to see this pass, but of course now uh, raises a whole bunch of new questions about how it gets implemented, uh, what effects it's going to have on parties and politicians and campaigns. And so uh, thank you for for sharing your thoughts with us, and we look forward to checking back in with you <laughs> once this actually comes a reality. Thank you so much for having me on. It's, um, I mean, as you say, there's so many more questions, and it's it's really fascinating and complicated and um, yeah certainly watching it very closely thank you grant the masha is a co-production of the carnegie endowment for international peace and the hindustan times this podcast is an ht smartcast original and is available on htsmartcast.com you can also find us on apple Podcasts, google spotify or wherever you get your podcasts don't forget to rate and review it helps others find the show more easily for more information about the show and to find the writing we mentioned on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Mira Verghese is our executive producer. Thanks for listening, and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production, brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.